Welcome everyone. If you could please keep your microphone muted until the end when question time, that would be very helpful. Um, my name is Chuck Kayser. I live in Kyoto City. I farm in the mountains north of Kyoto City. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be joined by John Walsh, who's also a gardener farmer. And we're here to present to you some ideas and some tips on your spring garden. Uh, for me, I grow all organic vegetables and I distribute them directly to customers in Kyoto City. And this year I'm instituting a, a post office delivery system as well. Uh, John, why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, thanks, for, um, thanks a lot for, um, for joining this um, second version of uh, Fantastic Farming. It's good to see people there. Um, yeah, I'm basically a uh, Tokyo based. I'm urban farming consultant and teacher, and I have uh, basically uh, teach mainly all children how to grow food naturally. Um, and because of that, I'm launching um, three uh, school urban farming programs as from last month and next week. So that's a big focus. And I'm also uh, focusing on teaching uh, just um, um, anyone who wants to learn about how to grow food um, in the city which has a whole lot of different challenges that, um, than um, um, and countryside farmers like, unlike Chuck need to face. So we're basically going to be presenting um, tips and information about countryside farming and urban farming to basically give you all a, a really a broad overview of uh, and ways that we can grow food, uh, more food faster. And back to you, Chuck. Thanks, John. I really appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, for joining. I know some people will be coming in as we're talking, but that's no problem. As I said, please just keep yourself muted while we're talking so that we can get a nice, smooth recording. Uh, this will be going up on my YouTube channel, and uh, we'll be sharing that for everybody to see. Uh, with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and begin my presentation. <clears throat> And let's see, I'm going to go full screen on that. There we go. Okay, so today's topic is really to get your spring garden off and running as, as best as you can. And for me, as I said, I'm an organic farmer. I grow in soil. I don't grow in containers uh, very much. I do a little bit, uh, but mostly just on the farm. I grow uh, about 50 or 60 different uh, kinds of plants and each each of those I probably grow three or four different varieties sometimes as many as 10 or 20. So really I grow about three or four hundred different species every year and uh, I wanted to give you uh, listening those of you listening some insights on how to how I best manage that and it's it's different for everybody the one thing I've learned growing all these years is what works for one person may not work for another person. Um, there's differences in soil, there's differences in uh, light, temperature, uh, weather, there's differences in insects, and so many other things. So if you're struggling with something that you're growing, whether it be in a container on your balcony or a small garden or even a large farm, look around at other people who are in a similar situation and don't feel disheartened because there is a huge learning curve to growing food. And it's more about the process than the product is one thing I always keep in mind is even if you fail this year, it's not really a failure. You've just, again, learned one more way not how not to do it. And that's something that uh, we're all, we're all going to learn. And that's part of the lifelong learning of growing your own food. And the first thing that I think of when I'm going to grow my own food is how to prepare my beds. Um, this is a very important step for farmers um, or gardeners, even if it's just a container of soil, you've got to think about what kind of soil you're going to use, what kind of container, where you're going to put it. But for a farmer, we usually have permanent beds. And so it's basically just, okay, I've got to see how I'm going to prepare those. And I'm going to divide farmers right now into two different kinds of farmers, till and no-till. I'm going to talk a little bit about no-till farming. I, I've practiced it a little bit, half out of laziness, half out of experimentation. Uh, the farm work does get away from me sometimes. So I don't always get around to tilling my beds. And I just go, oh, well, I'm going to try no-till this year with this one. <laughs> and basically what that means is you don't disturb the soil. 
uh, disturbing the soil is a big thing for farmers to really kind of mix in some soil amendments or just to make it lighter and fluffier and things like that. Um, that's what tilling does. But no-till farmers generally don't disturb their soil so much and basically add layers of mostly compost to the top of their soil every year. Whatever soil amendments they're using, they just put right on the top. Now, some of them do dig in, but they don't really mix the soil too much. I'm gonna go on to the next one, which is uh, hand tilling. And you can see here, I'm kneeling next to my X carrot bed, which I've already harvested out. And this was just last week. So this is a pretty current shot. And you can see in my hand is basically a hand trowel. And that's something I use to mix the beds. And you can see it used here. Pretty straightforward. That's uh, one of the easiest tools to use. And if you've got a small area, it's a very efficient way to mix your soil up. I move up the, the scale a little bit. And this is, I'm not even quite sure what the name of this is. I call it a fork haddock or mattock, and uh, that's good enough for me. But you can see it's a very top, he uh, bottom heavy tool. And what you wanna do is use this uh, heaviness to your, to your advantage rather than to fight it. And basically uh, to use this tool, you mix the soil like this. It does require a little bit of upper body strength, but this is a very efficient tool. When my tiller broke a few years ago, this is how I mainly mix all of my soil. And it does take a lot of energy. But once you get into the groove and start using the weight to your advantage, it's not that bad. However, when you've got uh, you know two farms of about 30 beds, each about 15 or 20 meters long, that's a lot of work. So if you're gonna go into this, I recommend you stretch first. <laughs> a third way, and something that I think is a lot more efficient, is to use what's called a broad fork. Broad forks are really good for mixing soil. They're also great for harvesting carrots and potatoes and uh, sweet potatoes and uh, taro or satoimo. This is great for just about anybody. You don't need a lot of upper back, uh, upper body strength because basically you're using your feet and, and your, your, the weight of your body to insert it into the soil. And then you use it like this. It's a great way to just kind of loosen up your soil. And you can see that if you're right next to a row of carrots or a spot of potatoes, it's just going to pull those right up to the surface. You can buy these at most home centers. There's some different varieties. This is a particularly heavy one made of steel, but I also have a much lighter version made of aluminum. So you might want to look around and find one that suits you. It's a really great tool to use if you're going to go uh, to mix up your soil. Now, of course, the easiest, fastest, and most expensive way to mix your soil is to use a tiller. And these are gasoline powered, and uh, they really do a great job of mixing up your soil. Um, you can see in, this, in the right-hand picture, there's actually a furrow attachment on the back that will create a gap for you to have a walkway or a planting area uh, for your potatoes or something like that. These are great. I just got a new one. I crowdfunded, I kind of uh, crowdfunded it. I'm still crowdfunding it. But um, again, it's a big investment and uh, it's hard to move it around. So if you're going to get one, make sure you have a place to put it. Next, let's move on to organic soil amendments. Now, I, I like to say soil amendments because not everything is a fertilizer. There's lots of things that I put into my soil that aren't ex, you know, ex, actually feeding my plants, which is something I think of a fertilizer doing. But of course, compost being kind of on the border there. Compost is something that feeds the plants and the soil a little bit, but it also creates a great tilth and soil body and a very healthy population of composting bacteria, which does a lot for your plants that isn't exactly feeding them. So it's creating a great environment. In there. Manures are also very popular organic amendments, and I have some other ideas as well. 
But compost is where I start and finish my soil amendments because I think it is the best way to feed your soil. And not only that, but you're going to be recycling your food waste, which is great. It's absolutely fantastic because who wants to have a bunch of stinky food waste sitting outside their house for the crows to take with them for lunch that day? So instead, you can put it into your uh, compost pile. And after a few months to a year, you have great soil amendment and you don't have to throw that away, creating a higher carbon footprint. But to do composting, you need to be respectful of your neighbors. If you're composting and you've got neighbors, you got to make sure you're not attracting crows or rats or cats <laughs> or cockroaches or a whole spectrum of things will want to come and eat your food waste. So you've got to make sure you're doing it properly, safely and responsibly. First, first of all, you have to have a lot of browns or carbons in, in your compost pile. More than your food waste, you need things like fallen leaves, hay, and shredded newspaper, things like this that are going to keep your pile dry and balanced. Otherwise, it's just going to be a big wet mess that's going to ferment and not give you what you want. So this is me collecting leaves at a local shrine here in Kyoto. Yes, I do have permission. I don't just sneak on there and take it. But this is a, a gold mine. For me, I, I just absolutely love fall leaves for my compost. It also is a great mulching tool if you want to suppress weeds and keep the moisture in your beds during the hot summer months. A buddy of mine has started an initiative in Kyoto to collect coffee grounds from local cafes and restaurants in Kyoto City. And this is me picking up about 30 or 40 kilograms of those coffee grounds that would otherwise be thrown away. These are absolutely wonderful for your compost pile and your plants, very high in nitrogen. And one of my favorite uh, radio show hosts and podcasters, Mike McGrath out of Philadelphia, he says that mixing these fall leaves with these coffee grounds is one of the best recipes for great compost for just about any plant. So I do that in mass. I do that to about two tons of leaves and, co and coffee grounds a year. And it, I do a static pile. I don't really turn it very much. So it takes a year or more to really break down, but that's okay because once, you've, once you're into that second year, you've got a constant supply and you'll be very happy with the results, I think. And this is me actually building my compost pile near my farm. You can see the leaves that I just picked up from the shrine in the truck. And what I'm holding in the yellow barrel there is the coffee grounds. And the kind of beige colored thing you see on the top there is actually called momigara or rice chaff. And it's what they knock off the rice before they create genmai. And if you want, you can also use nuka, which is the, the powder that they knock off the rice to, to change uh, brown rice into white rice. All great soil amendments, all things that could be readily available to you if you just meet your local rice farmers. Now this is me doing some home composting because I have a little space beside my house. Again, I did not add food waste to this compost because I did not want to attract undesirables. This is just uh, basically fallen leaves, which will also compost very well into a very nice compost. But it won't, it'll be a little less nitrogen rich and it will take a little bit longer because it doesn't have something to catalyze it into getting really hot and feeding the bacteria, but it will work just fine. Now, uh, manures, uh, popular ones, this is cow manure at the home center. And you can see it sells for after tax about three 300 yen a bag. And Cow manure is a great compost. Some people don't like it. A lot of animal activists or vegans will refuse to eat vegetables grown with, with manures, but I think it is a popular choice for organics. It's quite strong, so I wouldn't use so much if you're container growing, <clears throat> but as a farmer, adding it to my beds not only creates some fertility, but it also gives some good soil health because those cows are basically creating compost in their stomachs. Chicken manure is a lot stronger, and funnily enough, it's a lot cheaper. It's more than less than half the price of uh, cow manures at the home centers. This is very volatile <laughs> stuff, though, everyone. I don't want you to use this lightly. Make sure you do your research. It is very strong. It can burn your plants, and it can also give you undesirable results. Again, high nitrogen fertilizers, such as, comp such as uh, manures, wouldn't be very effective with 
flowering plants or beans and peas, because those things don't want a whole lot of nitrogen. So again, read your labels, do your research before you put it in your soil. Now, of course, buying bags of manures creates a lot of plastic waste. So after looking around, you may find a local cow or chicken farm where you can get it delivered without packaging. This is a definitely uh, a good point for, uh, for us farmers if we can reduce the packaging and usually it'll be cheaper as well. I got this load of cow manure from a local dairy farm that deliver uh, about two tons for about uh, five or 6,000 yen. And this is actually uh, four tons. Uh, I got a double order. And then it just sits there just fine. It's already composted so it can go right into the garden, no problem. Had some people up help me move it. And believe it or not, even though you tell the kids it's cow poop, they don't mind. They don't mind at all. They're not even wearing gloves and they're touching it and they're playing in it and stuff like that. So it is safe to use. But again, we washed our hands before we ate lunch, of course. Now, this is a chicken manure, which is something you definitely want to make sure you wear gloves when you handle. Um, it's I guess, as I said, it's a lot more concentrated and a lot more dangerous. So be careful when you handle it. Again, if you know a chicken farmer like I do, um, I have an egg farmer in my valley, which I, who I buy my eggs from. And often he asks me to come help him shovel out his, uh, his hen house, and then I can get the manure from my garden. But I have to compost it first. That's the thing. So I can't use it directly. Now, I was talking about momigata or rice chaff before. This is my organic rice farmer who lives on Lake Biwa. And when I saw his pile, I was just jumping for joy. This stuff is great to use in the garden. It's not going to give you any fertility, though. This is really going to uh, do something to develop the body of your soil. It's going to help create drainage. It also acts as a wonderful, wonderful mulch. Now, it's also great in the compost pile. Um, it doesn't break down very fast. In fact, it takes more than two years to disappear from the soil. Um, I think it's just a very hardy grain a husk, and that's why it protects the rice so well. But in your soil, it isn't going to sequester carbon or nitrogen as much as if you put fresh leaves in there, but it's going to create this drainage and this body to everything that really helps things work a lot better. Now, one thing you may not expect, unless you're living on the coast, is that Seaweed is a fantastic fertilizer, and you can use it uh, in your garden pretty much directly. Of course, you can compost it first. And if you know a seaweed farmer like I do, you can get as much as you can carry because they're just looking to dump the stuff, basically. And this is all the, 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 thing, the seaweed that they cannot use for sale. And this is wakame, by the way. Now, what I did with this was I just put it right on top of my compost pile and it's big, wet, messy, uh, not even stinky, but just very wet and sticky. And uh, in about a week, it was all dried out. And in about two months, you couldn't even find the, the, the seaweed anymore. It was just disintegrated in there. And then you can use it right on your beds. But I tried it as a mulch. I put this kind of seaweed right on my beds around my Swiss chard, and it did just fine. And no, you don't have to worry about washing it too much. The salt in there is partly the minerals that are going to be so good for your garden anyway. Uh, but again, do your own research before you do anything with amending your beds, because for your particular situation, you're going to want to make sure you know as much as possible. Let's talk about seeding. Now, a lot of people will just buy transplants from the home center, and I do that a lot as well. I mean, I spend hundreds of dollars every year buying transplants. But this year, I'm also raising my own babies. And if we have time at the end, I'm going to give you a little insights into that. And this is where seeding comes into place. And really, there's two ways to go about seeding. Direct sow, or putting it right in where you're going to grow that plant out, whether it's a container in your bed, or starting it in pots. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I pulled this off of the um, Virginia Co-op Extension. Um, it's a great, it's a really good uh, list of what you should, what you can transplant and what you should direct sow. Now, you can find this information online. Don't worry about taking notes or screenshots. You can find this yourself, I'm sure. And it doesn't have to be the Virginia Co-op Extension version. There's lots and lots of websites that share this sorts of information. However, I want you to know that even though that a lot of these things say you have to direct sow them, there are some shortcuts and secrets if you did want to give yourself a head start. Now, you may be asking yourself, Chuck, why would you 
try to transplant something that should be directly sown. And the reason is this, you can get a little bit of season extension, which means you get a jump on things. Rather, rather than putting a seed out in the middle of April, you put a baby plant out there and you're a month ahead of the game. You get your vegetables a month early, and that's just a lot more vegetables for you, especially if it's something like tomatoes or peppers or eggplants that are just going to keep producing for you until it gets too cold, then you're going to want to get them as soon as possible. <clears throat> now, a lot of people will use these uh, trays to do their seeding, and I, I, this is my setup here. Um, I love this. This is, this is fantastic. Um, it's the, kind of the best way to... Um, to get a lot of seeds going at the same time. And you just buy some soil at the home center, you fill it half full of soil, you seed everything, you put it, you fill it off with soil. And as John likes to say, and as I agree, about a centimeter of soil is about all you need on top of those seeds. You don't want any more, especially if it's these kinds of green leafy vegetables like lettuces and cabbages. And I see some hoxai or Chinese cabbage and some broccolis and kales growing there as well. So you want to make sure about that. But this is something I started this year and I just took one of those little pots that you buy a tomato plant in in the home center you know and I filled it halfway with uh, actually a rich bark compost that will hold water and then I sprinkled about well this must be 30 or 40 seeds in there of lettuce and then I covered that off with a nice dry potting mix and I and in three or four days this is what I get and it's just amazing and then I can once they start to put out some true leaves I'll soak I'll take that out of the pot I'll soak it in water separate all these and I'll put them in their own separate pot and I'll have 30 or 40 heads of lettuce in about two months it's a great way to save money save space and have a lot of fun doing it it's great doing these sorts of things I gotta tell you and of course, this is the size pot you want to start your tomato plants in or your, your uh, cucumbers and your peppers and things like that. The difference between this pot and this pot, this pot is made of plastic and this pot is made of compressed peat, which means this pot you plant directly into the garden. This one, you're going to take the plant out of it and then put it in the garden. So the advantage with this one is twofold. First of all, you won't be damaging the roots at all when you try to transplant it. It'll just go straight through that pot. The second one being, even though if you go back to some of those direct sow plants, such as, uh, let's see, it says pumpkins on here, doesn't it? Pumpkins right here. Pumpkins are a great thing to start and watermelons I see on there as well. Pumpkins and watermelons are a great thing to start in these peat pots. <clears throat> because that way you don't have to disturb the roots for them. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing my slide for some reason. It's going to advance doubly. So you can plant those watermelons and those uh, pumpkins in these peat pots and then put them into the garden without disturbing the roots. Most of the things that need to be direct sown, it's because they don't like their roots fiddled with too much. They're too sensitive. So this is a great shortcut for that. This is another one. This is peas. Now, peas were also on that direct sow list because the roots, again, they don't like to be fiddled with too much. And what I did was I just bought a whole sleeve of these paper cups and I start my peas in there uh, with some soil and some water. And once they're starting to sprout, I put them in the sunshine. And once they're ready to plant out, what I do is I just take a handy pair of scissors, which you can't see on the screen, and I just cut the bottom of the pot. I cut like a, a cross. And then I kind of open it up, dig my hole, put the pot right in there. And then I cover that around and the plant will go straight up and straight down through the bottom. And it's very efficient. <clears throat> if you were part of our last uh, uh, fantastic farming feature, um, you'll know that this is also a great way to prevent cutworms or yodomushi from biting your plants off at the soil level. So it's a great protection because it creates a call, natural collar around your plant. And then those, those, uh, those beetle larvae can't get to your plant with their little cutters on the front of their face and, and take them out. This is something I haven't experimented with, but I'd like to at some point. It's called soil blocking. And this is a great way to start your seeds without any sorts of containers at all. A uh, very efficient way. Unfortunately, it's not popular enough in Japan to have a reasonably priced uh, uh, product on the market, but I'm still looking and I'm still waiting. Maybe it'll be something I asked my sister to send me for Christmas this year, but a soil blocking is a great way to go as well. Plant supports. How are you gonna plant, support your plants once they start growing? 
You can stake them, you can trellis them, and there's a few other ways to go about it. This is staking tomatoes. Staking means you, you put a single stake or stick into the ground and your plant grows around it or you tie it to it. And it's a great way to grow a lot of different plants. Tomatoes grow well this way, eggplants can grow well this way, peppers, um, things like that. <clears throat> This is a trellis, and a trellis is something that's usually made either out of wood or metal, and your plant will grow in and around that, and that trellis will support it very well. Again, this is great for tomatoes, for cucumbers, and beans, and peas, and things like that. This is a popular trellising technique that I've taken to for my peppers, but they're doing it for tomatoes with two stakes for each plant, but instead of actually tying to the stake, what you do is you have strings running between them. This is called a Spanish trellis. And I think what we were looking at the last picture was also a Spanish trellis, I couldn't really tell. But it's again using two strings and it's a very efficient way to do peppers. This is a little bit different. If you can see, each plant has its own single string. And I believe what they're growing here is probably pole beans. That's what the leaves look like to me. And um, I do this for my tomatoes, believe it or not. And what I do, and what they have is a, a pole at the top and a pole at the bottom for the string to be tied off. What I do is I actually tie to a top pole and then at the bottom, I actually tie it to the bottom of my plant. And then as the plant starts to grow, I just wrap the plant around it, wrap the plant around it till it finds its way. My tomatoes grew like gangbusters on this this, this past year. And I grow uh, baby, uh, the mini tomatoes. I don't grow the big ones. And so they wanted to create all these suckers. I just tried to keep up. And when one got away from me, I put it in a new string. It's a great way to grow a lot of different vegetables quite efficiently and create very little plastic waste. Uh, you can see on the left side there my pea trellis, and for those you can actually buy a special endo net, which is a, a, bean, a pea net, or you can just use a cucumber net. Super, e super easy to find, super cheap, and easy to install. And you can see the peas just absolutely find it fantastic to grow upon. They, they get quite large and they start pulling down on that net. And the winds in Japan are quite strong, so I often put some wrapping around the whole enchilada so that it doesn't blow away. Now, pest prevention. This is a huge one because we get lots and lots of pests here in Japan. There's a lot of ways to go about preventing pests from getting to you because once they're there, boy, they're tough to get rid of. So it's all about prevention for me. These floating row covers are a great way to keep things like cabbage butterflies away and other beetles and things that eat your uh, plants. You can see the plants grow really well under there. They're not blocked for sunlight or water or anything. Everything penetrates just fine. And uh, you can get a lot of plants very successfully. Unfortunately, it doesn't keep the weeds down, but it does help keep the insects away. Now, one of the most important things, and this is a YouTube video I have on my channel, is how to install row cover. This is more of a net row cover. The, the, the previous one was more of a, a gauze material. And the most important thing for this is to bury the edges, because I've found that in the previous, uh, what happened was, uh, I just kind of set these green poles on the edge and I thought, oh, that's enough. This picture was taken about seven years ago, by the way. And this, this video was made just a couple of years ago when I learned when those winds start blowing, they tear that stuff right up. So if you bury those edges, it keeps it set for the entirety until you're ready to move it. And also it makes it impossible for any insect to crawl under there. So I really recommend bury the edges of your row covers if you use them. Now, as far as bug sprays go, there is a plethora of options on the internet, easy to find, just do your own search. Again, I just took this image off the internet to show you just how many options there are. And many of them are insect specific. So you make sure you find out, oh, I've heard neem oil is great for insect suppression. Well, it may not be for the insect that you're dealing with. So make sure you do your research. But it's quite easy to, to make your own neem oil spray. This is my own bottle and I write the recipe right in an old spray bottle. Super easy, super uh, wonderful for the farm and all organic. Now, what better way to prevent insects than to plant more plants that'll drive those insects away? Yes, there are some plants that other insects do not find palatable. They're just too stinky. And so, I feel, again, I took this off the internet credits to tomato dirt. Um, it's a wonderful way to have more plants in your garden and less 
harmful insects. Now, the last thing you might want is some beneficial insects coming around. Of course, the praying amanus, it's, it's, it's one of the good ones, but I'll give uh, 10 points to anybody who can tell me what it is on the left there. Just put it in the chat if you know. I'll tell you at the end, but this is a great insect for suppressing aphids. It's absolutely fantastic. And while you may not recognize it in its larva form, if I were to show you its adult form, you'd know it right away. So again, put that in the chat and see if you can get it. Now, the last thing I recommend is look at the bottom of your plants before you buy them at the home center. And this is plants that I grew up myself, so I make sure I look at the bottom before I put them in the garden. Because it's quite easy to spray these little aphids that you'll find on the bottom of some leaves with a hose if you've grown them out yourself. But if it's at the home center, you better just put that transplant right back where you found it and not buy it. Because I don't recommend buying insects and importing them into your beds because they can be a big big mess in a big hurry. Now, again, I was going to talk about my babies. I'm just going to quickly go because it is John's turn to start, but I just wanted to show you some, some of my seeds that I've started. You'll see packs from America, Japan, and from all over the world that I've been collecting and getting. And these are the plants that I'm growing out. This is my setup with grow lights, and I've got a little heating mat underneath. These are all uh, cucumbers and eggplants and tomatoes that I've got in my house too. And I got to tell you, my wife is not too happy about it, but she loves me. So she puts up with it. And uh, yep, that's all I've got. And I recommend that anybody who, uh, who's interested in growing your own vegetables, you try it from seed. It, it, it just extends the whole process. If you like growing vegetables or flowers or everything, just take it one step further and start from seed. You won't regret it. It'll give you that much more time with the vegetable or the flowers and that much more connection. And that's all for me. And I hope you had, uh, oh, let's take a look at the chat, see if anybody got the correct answer. Uh, ladybug larva, yes, yeah, Solving and Rebecca, you both get 10 points, good job. They certainly are a lot uglier than their, than their adult versions, but they are voracious eaters of, of aphids. So if you can get some of those in your garden, you're good to go. John, it's off to you, Ben. Um, yeah, thanks for, um, thanks for that, Chuck. That was really, really good. Um, just got a few questions about what you're talking about there. Um, yeah, the first one is, um, can you give us some tips about when is the, uh, what is the best time to actually start uh, sowing seeds outside? What are the things that we need to know before we uh, start to um, uh, uh, sow seeds? Now you're talking about sowing seeds outside, John? Outside, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like basically um, uh, uh, in the following winter, because uh, it's um, basically it's, um, too cold during winter time uh, what's the borderline like between uh, winter and spring what are the uh, the signs that we need to know so that we know when it's a good time to sow seeds good question i gotta say first of all with climate change there is a learning there's a whole new learning curve out there uh this past winter for everyone who's listening i'm sure it was much colder and a lot more snow this year and what you do for setting your seeds out in the spring <clears throat> um is you have to check when your last frost date is going to be. And you don't want to plant seeds out or baby plants one that's going to have a frost because it's just going to kill them off. So you, you do your research, you look online for the weather report, and you make sure that um, you, uh, you have the timing right. And that's why I start my seeds in small pots in that little greenhouse that I made at the end there you saw. Uh, because that gives me some season extension so they can grow up big and strong. If you're going to seed in the summer, basically any time is okay because the soil is warm enough. Just beware of pests. Again, once that little baby plant comes out, there are a multitude of things that want to eat it. So you want to make sure you use a floating row cover or something to protect it. Uh, as far as fall <laughs> planting, it's pretty much the same. The soil's already warm. But for winter, usually what I do is I get too much snow for really some really efficient winter growth. I just get spring, summer, and fall growth. But um, what is nice is in the, in, the, in the winter, just before it gets too cold, you can plant your peas and they'll get up a little bit. You know, you'll see some leaves coming and then the snow will cover that. They won't die. And kale is strong as well. Uh, there's some other vegetables as well that'll overwinter. And then when the snow melts, they'll continue growing and you'll get that much of a jump on um 
on your stuff. So I recommend that you try that uh, with your seeding. And again, follow the frost, get, frost dates and uh, look online for information. I'm always looking online for, uh, for uh, information because and, I can't keep um, it in my head. <laughs> yeah. And um, one more question there just about um, I'm growing um, green leafy vegetables. And um, what's the best uh, fertilizer or uh, soil additive that you recommend to grow green leafy vegetables? Green leafy vegetables in the farm, I like manures, to be honest with you. Manures are a great, great source of nitrogen and other minerals. They're re readily available and inexpensive. And it's also, again, creating a circle for the stuff that would otherwise just be thrown away. This isn't something they're going into a laboratory or a factory and creating from chemicals and creating a big carbon footprint. This is something that people are eating the eggs or the meat from these animals. So they're going to be, it's just gonna be thrown away. So again, it's something that you can recycle, put back into your soil and create great, healthy, green leafy vegetables. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Okay, um, I'd just like to um, share my screen now. Uh, so I'll just uh, get stuck into that. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> so, um, what I've sort of been doing um, um, at the start of spring now is just to uh, um, launch my um, home balcony garden. And also I'm launching um, some school urban farming programs. Um, I'll just get into that very soon. Just gotta work out how to share the screen. Um, <clears throat> hang on. Um, <clears throat> We farmers, also, we struggle with this technology, um, don't we? <laughs> yeah. And also, I've been um, renovating some um, rooftop gardens, so which I'll uh, be going into very soon. Okay, um, just sharing my screen now. You should see a um, fantastic farming screen show up on your screen very soon. Can you, you see that? You got it, John. Got it. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, this, the, uh, the main topics I'm going to be talking about today is how to uh, refresh your old garden soil that you, and that if you're growing uh, food here in the city you've um, probably been using soil before you know either planter boxes or uh, uh, flower pots or um, other kind of planting um, containers <clears throat> and once that um, gets used for a lot, sort of more than one or two seasons um, there won't be so many um, nutrients left in it so we need to um, find a way to restore those nutrients um and um yep and so that's the first thing that i'll be talking about number two is how to set up a balcony garden at home just to maximize how much food that you grow and point number three how to launch school gardens which uh, won't have any direct interest to uh to many people but it's a um, big deal and a growing thing um in cities like tokyo and then the last topic I'll go into is how to set up rooftop gardens, which is a really, really good way to maximize how much food uh, that you grow at home or school or at work. <clears throat> so, um, hang on, just get into, yep. So um, the first topic is how to refresh and renew your old soil. Um, 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 when you're growing plants, um, they will basically be extracting nutrients from the soil as they grow. So it's important to uh, to know how to replace those nutrients over time. <clears throat> and um, and the sort of rule of thumb there is after uh, like about two seasons, it's a good idea to take out the top half of your soil in your flower pots or your planter boxes and then uh, um, put some new soil in and simply mix it up. So you guys see mixing up the new soil with the old soil. Um, and that will um, help to restore the nutrients that have been taken out by the plants. And then you can also do what, uh, what Chuck was talking about um, um, during his uh, session, basically add compost or manure. That would be good for larger uh, planter boxes. Um, and you can also, um, if you've been using soil for years, you can also, yeah, uh, that soil may contain bugs that could be uh, chomping your plant roots. So it's a good idea to actually uh, one way to get rid of them is to basically put down some tarpaulin or a plastic sheet in a sunny place and pour your soil onto it and basically make it flat and dry it out and that will help to kill the bugs and then you can basically put that soil back 
uh, I can do your planting um, containers again. Add some new soil, stir it up, and that should be um, should be good to go for the um, um, your next round of planting. Um, next up, um, how to set up a balcony garden. This is really good fun, and I've heard that yeah, basically like most people in places like Tokyo do have balconies. Um, if you're lucky, you'll be on the sunny side of the building. Um, and that will uh, like present you with a whole lot more options to grow food than if you're not. And uh, yep. So um, what kind of uh, food we, can we grow? That basically depends on how much sun that we get. Okay, so um, just a general um, rule of thumb is that if you like tomatoes, like most of us do, uh, tomatoes need a lot of sunshine. Uh, they need um, at least about four to five hours direct sunshine. And so do cucumbers. So basically the plants that, that grow uh, fruit need maximum sunshine. In contrast, uh, green leafy vegetables like lettuces and spinach and komatsuna and most herbs, they don't need so much uh, sunshine because they don't um, um, like produce any fruit. And so your green leafy vegetables, you can get away with about two to three hours of direct sunlight um, on them. But the, um, the climbing vegetables that produce fruit, they need much more. So, um, and um, this basically means that if you try growing a tomato plant on your balcony and it only gets a few hours of sunshine per day, it will probably grow to its normal height, but it probably won't grow many tomatoes. And the same thing with cucumbers. And I'll go into um, rooftop gardens later, which will basically show, which will give us the chance to basically grow tomatoes and cucumbers and other climbers properly, just to maximise how many um, and how much food that we get. Um, uh, what can a balcony garden look like? Uh, depends on your creativity, really. Um, and it sort of depends what you want to do with it too. So you might want to create a, a relaxing space just to like sort of go and chill out in, or you might want it to um, um, to be a place to grow food, uh, somewhere that uh, smells nice. So like you might want to use lots of herbs and flowers um, to produce like uh, nice uh, fragrances or just a combination of everything. Um, this is my, uh, this is some garden I've been doing during the last week on my balcony at home. The left-hand photo has two planter boxes that I've got suspended on steel braces on the, um, under the balcony wall, and I've got some lettuces growing in them. And the right-hand photo, uh, some newly sown uh, seeds that I sowed during the week, they've just come out, and uh, fragrant flowers, so that when my wife puts the washing out, it's a nice uh, smell there. Um, another really good idea for balconies is to basically put a shelving unit outside and use it to put plant to, uh, to put planter boxes on. That's a really good way to make sure that they uh, that they receive maximum uh, sun exposure just by sort of like lifting up the pots. Um, yep. So what can a balcony garden look like? I'll just take you through some. Uh, photos now just to give you some ideas, some dreams. These are really cool. So um, um, location is of course uh, critical and s s sun exposure too. Um, one thing that I mentioned in my um, urban farming workshops is that your growing space doesn't necessarily need to be your own. Um, if you know someone, like if you have a friend or, or a workmate or a relative or a neighbor who's got some growing space that receives more sunshine than your growing space do, uh, does, then just ask to share. Um, there's a possibility that they may not be gardeners themselves, but they may have a big sunlit uh, rooftop or a uh, deck or something like that. And if you just uh, basically like ask them kindly, um, I can grow food, I can show you how to grow food. Would you like me to come over and set up a garden and I'll grow food for both of us. That's a good idea to expand your growing space when you don't actually have much yourself. Okay, um, 
So yeah, this one here, this is quite nice. Lots of colorful flowers there. Um, just one point about, um, we are, yeah, you know, for people who like growing flowers and shrubs and trees and so on, basically non-food plants, um, a, it's really simple just to, um, um, the simplest way to start growing food is uh, to basically look where any plants are grown, like for example, a flower or a shrub, and simply switch the plant. And you need to switch the soil too, because um, um, food that we grow needs nutrients that naturally comes from the soil. So if, if someone's growing a flower or a tree or some kind of shrub, that can just be switched to growing a lot, a lot of lettuces or spinach or herbs, whatever. So basically wherever something can grow is a place where you can grow food. Um, here's some climate like Chuck was going about before. Uh, these tomatoes, they need to be staked up. I think yeah, uh, these ones are, you can just see the stakes behind the, uh, the main stem of the tomato there. Uh, more tomatoes, black ones by the looks of it. Um, and you can see here that, um, the people behind these gardens, they've been lifting up their planting containers too, for the reason that I mentioned before, just to maximize their exposure to the sun. Now, um, some tips when it comes to balcony garden preparation in terms of layout and um, elevation and so on. Um, number one, make sure that your balcony is strong enough to hold planter boxes because when soil gets wet, um, and when your regular soil gets wet, uh, the weight will likely double. So if your balcony is uh, part of like a old building or you're not sure about how strong it is, you might just want to talk to the architect. Uh, but uh, most of the time there'll be no problem. Um, you might want to check about drainage too, because if any soil drains out from your planter boxes, then it goes down the drain and might block the drain um, and cause flooding, which you don't want. So you might just need to put a little uh, filter cover over any uh, drainage holes on your balcony or just make sure that no soil drains out from the bottom of your planting containers. Um, point number two there is the most simplest point of all. Um, if you're not sure where to grow food on your balcony, just look for the part of your balcony that receives the most sunshine and put most of your plants there. That's it. Um, you may need to move the, um, some planting containers around because um, some plants may uh, not like too much sunshine and might like more shade or vice versa. So if you're setting up a, a balcony garden for the first time, um, you might need to move some plants around just to find the best places for them to grow. Um, and the fourth point, um, consider elevating or basically lifting up your planting containers um, just to maximize their exposure to the sun and that will basically grow more food. And to do this, you might want to put some planter boxes on a table or on a shelving container or hang them from the ceiling even, like strawberry pots that um, can hang down from the ceiling. Uh, just think of uh, any ways that you can lift up your planting containers. Um, some people put a plank on top of the aircon uh, um, unit on the balcony that becomes like a, like a table that you can put um, uh, like flower pots and planting containers on. Um, some more tips, um, especially during the, and the warmer part of the year, like the start and the main part of summer, uh, smaller, uh, the soil in smaller containers um, dry out faster than soil in larger containers. And when soil dries out, plants get stressed and then they might die. So and the goal here is to basically think big from the start. So sort of try to use larger planting containers rather than smaller ones. And then if you want larger plants, and once again, use larger pots. Because if you put a plant in a small pot, it's not going to grow very big because the roots are restricted. Uh, but if you, if you want a large, a large plant with more food, just use larger pots and then the roots will have more space to grow and the plant will grow bigger. Um, all other factors aside. Um, uh, beating the heat in summer, your 
Balcony is going to warm up quite a lot, and it's going to, and your plants will be hit by direct sunlight from the sun, and also they'll be warmed up by the warm deck, <coughs> which will stress out your plants. So it's a good idea to, um, um, like around about um, late June in Japan, it's a good idea to think about lifting up your planter boxes. So basically, put them onto blocks or just lift them off the surface of your balcony so that the planter boxes and containers are not directly touching it. And if you lift them up on just like blocks, then uh, that will basically uh, let uh, air flow beneath the pot uh, to keep, um, and that'll help to keep the soil cooler during the, um, during summertime. Uh, next, what kind of things that, uh, what kind of equipment can we use to set up a balcony garden? There's a whole lot when you go to your home school or uh, garden centre. And supermarkets sell, um, supermarkets, um, they will, um, uh, uh, larger supermarkets, uh, they should sell planter boxes and gardening equipment too. These are planter boxes there, um, they're all really cheap. These planter boxes that you can see here, they're about 800 yen, eight to 900 yen maximum. And these ones could be used to grow tomatoes and cucumbers and paprika and herbs and pretty much, and most vegetables, uh, like besides um, uh, long root vegetables like daikon. Um, planter boxes come in all shapes and sizes, all different prices, but for most of them, you're looking at maximum about 900 yen for a large one. So it's pretty cheap. Uh, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. And it's important to, to make sure um, that before you buy a planting container, look down the bottom and check it's got uh, water drainage holes. That's critical for the, uh, that lets water drain out of course. And you wanna put it on a tray too, just to keep your, uh, balcony deck clean, just in case any soil does come out the bottom or any dirty water. Um, if you're um, like um, longer lasting planting uh, containers, go for terracotta. They'll get hot, but they'll last for about 10 times longer, uh, most likely more than a plastic container. And just a rule of thumb, um, these planting containers that you can hopefully see on your right hand side of the screen, those long planter boxes, um, if they are exposed to the sun for about two years, they'll probably start to crack. So yeah, like about two years for those ones. Um, those ones there that you can see on the right hand side of the screen, they're quite thin. That's why. Um, um, they don't last so long, but the terracotta ones, they'll last for years and years and years um, until they um, basically crack or if not, yeah, they'll last for years. Um, so what else can we grow fruit in? Coffee cups from your local company. They can be used. We can use um, any sort of, any clean um, container can be used to grow fruit. So we can basically, uh, um, that opens up doors to recycling. Things like uh, this coffee cup here that we saw before, um, ramen bowls, uh, we can use, um, um, clean and washed food containers. Um, anything that's basically clean, you just basically just got to uh, punch some water drainage holes down the bottom and just put some pot stones down the bottom, add soil, and then you can either sow or transplant uh, seedlings in there. Um, grow bags. Um, we can buy these now from home stores. And they basically look like a big bag of soil, and that's pretty much exactly what they are. But they're normally uh, for specific vegetables. So this grow bag here that you can see in the middle of your screen, that's specifically, uh, that's got a soil formulation specifically to grow tomatoes. And you just cut the top of the bag and then use, um, I, th I think they come with seeds, and I'm not quite sure whether they come with seeds or not, but if not, you just put some tomato seeds in there or a seedling, and then just grow it uh, straight from the bag. Uh, small planter boxes, big planter boxes, round planter boxes, you can use the works. These are some terracotta pots. These are ones I 
tried growing tomatoes in a few years ago, just out the back of my house. That um, didn't work for the reason that I mentioned before, because there wasn't much uh, sunshine. So in the left-hand photo here, you can see a couple of tomatoes. I got a few more than that, but the tomato plant grew about two meters high. But it just um, didn't grow many tomatoes because this plant got only about two hours of direct sunshine uh, per day, which was not enough to produce a large number of tomatoes. Then we've got planter boxes. These ones have got lettuces in them, like you can see on the left hand side. Um, different, okay, this will give you some ideas about how to set up a balcony garden. This is probably the simplest way here. Can you see this one here of the uh, um, the uh, uh, different color flower pots? Yep. Um, it's a good idea to have them facing um, inside, just in case they get blown off and they drop down outside and they hit someone. Um, this here is a creation that I came up with a few years ago. It's just a uh, like a wire frame that I uh, bought from the 100 game shop. And I just bought some plastic flower pots and hooked them to the frame using little hooks and hung that up in front of the back uh, window. That works. Um, so do ladders. And this gets back to raising plants off the ground to maximize their sun exposure. Ladders, they're not bad to look at. And they do exactly that. They help to raise your plants off the ground. Um, if you don't have any exposed soil, or um, if you just have, yeah, um, if you have a fence, just use it to grow food. This is what I've done at one of the schools that I've been teaching at. You just get a whole lot of uh, flower pots and you hook them to the fence. And these can be used to grow um, even sort of medium sized vegetables like lettuces. They can be used to grow spinach, they can be used to grow all your herbs. But the plants, uh, especially the herbs, the ones that grow large, like basil and shiso and so on, they won't grow so big because these um, uh, flower pots aren't big enough for uh, for plants like basil to grow to their natural size. But these will be great for uh, flowers for small herbs like sage and oregano. Um, wouldn't be so good for rosemary because uh, um, rosemary can grow so big naturally. But these will be good um, to grow lettuces, which is like a medium sized vegetable. Uh, Shelving units, once again, just to lift the plants up. Um, this is a uh, deck garden that I uh, made for a kindergarten in Tokyo some years ago. And you might want to collect rainwater too, to basically use to water your garden. And what I did here, this is my uh, balcony at home, and I just uh, bought a big plastic sheet and um, clipped it to the balcony railing and attached one side to the side of the house. And this plastic sheet is in a, like a U-shaped, uh, a concave uh, a shape. And uh, when the rain drops into it, um, the sheet's actually um, angled down so the water water drains into this uh, this white water tank you can see down the bottom there. And there was one day yeah, of, uh, about three or four years ago where there was just a, um, it rained all day Saturday and I, uh, uh, I collected about 60 liters of rainwater which watered my gardens around the house for the next week. All free, that was good, that worked. Next topic is launching school gardens. This is what I'm doing right now, this is uh, uh, like a really big deal for my work right, right now because it's the start of spring and uh, like the autumn and winter season last year I've got the same three schools that I was teaching at um, in um, Tokyo and it seems that enthusiasm for school urban farming programs is really taking off now it's yeah it's fantastic there's more and more schools that base the um, that want gardens but don't currently have them but do have the potential to have gardens set up there so um, the, yeah, there's a, a lots of good reasons that schools might want um, to have urban farming programs set up. And one of the uh, 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 one of the best ones that I think is that basically 
um, these programs can teach students and the entire school community uh, how to grow food for life, which is a really big deal. It's like learning how to ride a bike. Once you learn that skill, you, you'll never forget. <clears throat> uh, and also because um, so many kids these days um, have allergies and a lot of them are coming from the food supply and basically what they're eating and the chemicals contained in that food. So if they learn how to grow their own food without chemicals, that's going to help them. <clears throat> um, and yeah, they can basically grow food to donate as well. This is one of the schools, uh, Seisen Catholic Girls School um, in, um, in Tokyo. Um, these are the gardens that I started last year with the girls, and I'm going to be restarting them again um, next Friday. <clears throat> and yeah, there's basically uh, there's two grade three uh, classes that I'm teaching there. Uh, Sacred Heart International School in Tokyo. Two uh, pictures here. Uh, we kicked off two uh, plots last year, which you can see in the foreground of the photo to the right. And over the last month, I've been out there every Tuesday morning with the girls, uh, basically digging up these other these new plots you can see in the left-hand photo. And we're now ready. We've now got seven plots ready to go, and we're going to be sowing seeds in them as from Tuesday, two days from now. Um, if the girls are going to start to sow seeds in them. Um, Alba Japan um, International School. This is my main school that I've been teaching at for the last three years. Massive gardens there, out the front and out the back. And if you look at the photos on the right-hand side, um, the one down the bottom is what their back garden kind of looks like now. It's all it's just all green. Lesson number one next Thursday, we need to... Um, um, uh, basically completely clear that so that it looks like the top right hand photo um, and sort of get it ready to sow seeds and plant uh, seedlings in from two weeks from now. Uh, we're going to be clearing uh, the gardens on Thursday next week and then start growing stuff on the following week. Um, if a school doesn't have any exposed soil, you can just use the fence, you can use the walls, you can use the rooftops. <coughs> And as Chuck knows, and as um, all um, gardeners know, the best place to grow food is basically the place where the sun shines most, point number one. Um, particularly with schools, it's a good idea to actually work with the kitchen if there is one and ask them uh, what do they want to serve and, and put on plates for the students. And then you can work with the kids to actually grow that food. Um, while also, uh, taking um, the food waste from the kitchen and getting the kids to make compost from it and use that compost to grow the food for the kitchen. So it, it creates a perfect uh, circle of sustainability, so to speak. And one more thing that I try for down, uh, point number three down the bottom is to not just think about students, but to think about training teachers, staff, and mums and dads of the students. So, so we're talking about the entire school community can get involved in an urban farming project and there's a number of ways to encourage people you can do like food tastings basically get the kids to go around their classes handing out tomatoes for example um, um, running um, garden salad events uh, donating food like this one here uh, this was the third uh, food donation from Alba Japan to Second Harvest Japan Food Bank in Tokyo last year. This was the largest one. Um, yep. Now, um, on rooftop gardens, I think this is my last point. Uh, this is a big deal. And it's a big deal uh, because um, rooftops typically get more sunshine than balconies do. And if you're living uh, uh, in a big city like Tokyo or Osaka, um, rooftops, they present the uh, uh, basically the best option for private homeowners and schools and companies too. So I'll just uh, show you some examples of what and how we can uh, grow food on a roof. Um, the next photo here is a uh, kindergarten in Tokyo. Um, I installed a uh, rooftop garden here, which you can see in the background behind these women here. And these are basically mums of the students. 
And last March, I planted 145 plants for them, mainly flowers and vegetables and herbs. And just a few days ago, I upgraded this because um, um, some plants had died during the winter. And I uh, planted about 45 new plants um, with my new gardening colleague in exactly the same place. And they've, yeah, they've now gonna have some seeds coming up. They've got lettuces, they got more herbs, they got more flowers coming up there. Um, and rooftop gardens can utilize raised gardens like these ones here, which are just, they're fantastic. Um, raised gardens are the next best thing to having a garden um, in the ground. And um, yeah, raised gardens, um, here's, here's um, two raised garden sites here. The uh, left-hand one is on top of Montessori School in Tokyo that I helped to set up two, uh, three years ago. And photos on the right-hand side show um, the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Tokyo where I set up some raised gardens there with a colleague in 2019 for them. Um, what? can go on a rooftop garden. Well, um, like I said, raised gardens, these are really good and they can be lifted up. Um, if you have uh, like uh, joint or mobility problems and you find it difficult to, to kneel down, raised gardens can be built to be uh, the height where you don't need to, um, don't need to, to kneel down. Um, this one that you can see here, it's only like about 20 centimeters above the, um, the ground surface there. And all it is is a garden and a, a wooden frame like that. And the frame doesn't need to be wood. It can be uh, concrete or concrete blocks. Um, and you just basically just need to have four sides that are joined either by screws or nails. This is um, the raised garden on top of Montessori School um, when it was being constructed, uh, two meters wide by four meters long. You see the right-hand photo, it's, uh, we put plastic sheet down the bottom. That's just to protect the surface of uh, the roof. Then we put soil on it. And it looks, it came to look like the left-hand photo here. That was about 20 centimeters of soil went in there. That's ideal to grow about 90% of your vegetables. So not much. <clears throat> and then if you want to get creative on your rooftop, that's a good idea. Uh, elevate your pots like that. These are terracotta pots that have been hooked to a steel frame. And if you want to recycle, you can you can just sort of recycle two liter um, um, drink bottles like this. Cut them in half. Um, invert the top half, and then you basically um, and put a a pot net um, down the bottom of the um, inverted top half just to stop the pot stones and soil dropping out. Then you cover the pot net with uh, about one centimeter of pot stones. That's to uh, filter the water. Then you put some soil in and you plant or sow. And you'll notice that these two liter pet bottles, they're all in um, um, vertical columns. That's so that when you water the top one, the water can drain through and drip into the next one below it, drip into the next one below it. And if you use lots of water, then you just need to water the very top pot and it'll water them all below. That's quite simple. <clears throat> um, this is just a wooden frame that looks purpose built. So is that, that looks really nice. Look at that tomato growing there in the middle and the side and side down the bottom. So this here, um, this one here is a really good idea of a wall that was useless, that's now useful. Um, this is good if you have a, a wall on your rooftop, um, or maybe uh, the stairwell. This could be the outside wall of your stairwell. And these here are basically uh, recycled um, uh, rain gutters from a house that have been screwed to the side and used to grow uh, lettuces by the looks of it. Like this too, these are purpose-built uh, planters. And if you want to get really creative and save money, 
chain gardens. These are basically, uh, just think of a, a clothesline and switch the clothes to, to these things, which I call uh, chain pots. Uh, basically just uh, just two litre, uh, two litre pet bottles that are uh, cut in half. And you, you, you need to make sure that you punch uh, water drainage holes down the bottom, of course, just to drain water. And that's what some, uh, some that I made last year looked like at the back of my house. And one of these chain pots uh, produces greens for one salad. And if you grow uh, baby leaf seeds um, in spring and summer, you're looking at um, about 12, uh, like about two weeks from sowing seeds until when they're ready to pick like that. <clears throat> Yep, okay, so, um, and then just sort of moving quickly on, we're um, uh, running like a bit short of time now. Um, this here, uh, this is something that I'd just like to go into. This is uh, specifically for uh, um, office blocks. And this is like one of my big goals for this year to basically uh, set up what I hope will be Tokyo's first corporate uh, rooftop garden. And the plan here is to basically um, um, talk to the different companies within a building. For example, the building might be 10 stories or, or 20 stories. And the goal here would be to basically talk to staff within the different uh, companies and ask them uh, who wants to uh, um, be part of a, um, a, a rooftop garden project on top of their building. And then um, um, talk to the people um, that I do want to be be part of it, and then if you look at the uh, the image on the top right here, um, those numbered uh, squares could be uh, basically uh, raised gardens for each of the different companies within the building, and then these staff that want to grow uh, food up there could basically go up there during their lunch breaks, smoke breaks, after work, whatever, and uh, grow food, sh share tips, share food, share tools make friends, make relationships. And um, the sky's, the, sky's um, the limit. They could basically have um, Friday night parties up there. Um, they could, yeah, they could uh, um, 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 uh, um, <laughs> um, share tips too. For example, like one, um, one company might be growing tomatoes and another company in another part of the rooftop might be growing herbs. They could um, basically um, talk to each other and share information so that they could grow their respective uh, food the next time. <clears throat> um, and just to quickly finish off, um, yep, the key points about it and rooftop gardens, number one, it's got to be safe. Number two, um, it needs to be accessible, of course, and close to a water supply. Okay, so that's my bit done. Um, hang on, I'll just switch back. Yep, so um, that's basically uh, um, uh, like about how to set up a uh, balcony garden, rooftop garden, and a little bit about school gardens too. That was great, John. <clears throat> nice work. I know that people are going to have some questions. Uh, I have a few for you first. Why do you throw away 50% of your soil? Why, why do you do that? Why don't you just keep it and mix it with some other soil and expand it? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a um, yeah, um, that's what yep, yeah, that's what could be done. Of course, you, you could just basically just uh, mix it with the new soil. In fact, that's what I'll probably do next time. Actually, yeah, just don't throw it away. Just uh, basically use all of it. One good, really good tip for you, John, is yeah. um, when because you, you buy bags of soil. Uh, yeah. keep the bags and then when you're done at the end of the year put that soil back into the bag and then you carry that to your next new garden and you use that to help build your next soil because it's a shame to just you know get rid of it and even if you're sprinkling around on the landscaping it's kind of going to waste when it's good garden soil um, I have got one other question when you elevate your plants something like a tomato or a cucumber that's going to get quite tall when it gets taller do you then lower it down so that it keeps getting taller and taller Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good point. Um, 
especially when you've got a, um, like a tomato plant growing on a balcony. Um, um, uh, when the plant's really, uh, when the plant's really small, uh, the sunlight might not uh, con uh, might not shine onto the leaves. So, like, you need to lift it up first. But I think once the sunlight catches the leaves, it will make the plant grow bigger, and then um, um, you'll be fine from that point on. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of gives you more space too, because otherwise it might get too tall, and then you yep. can't really harvest. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> okay. Well, we've got some questions in the chat. And uh, that I'll address first. But if people also want to unmute themselves, you can ask them live. First of all, Rebecca says she has two questions. She's heard that uh, that you have to leach cow manure before using it because of chemicals that cows are fed. Your thoughts, Chuck? Well, that is a great question. I've heard a lot of arguments against using cow manure. Um, as a professional grower, I find it is one of the easiest things to use and resource and. Uh, uh, one of the easiest things to use and find. So I haven't really gone deep on the sustainability of it. Again, when you're growing as a hobby, it's, it's basically stuff you're doing in your free time and you've already got a source of income. When it is actually part of your own source of income, it is tough to walk that line straight and, and true for sustainability 100%. Because if I'm gonna go 100% sustainable, basically you're gonna be paying $5 for a carrot. and there's not very many people that want to do that. So I've got to cut corners here and there and nobody's perfect. So if you want the perfect vegetable, you're going to have to probably produce it yourself. If you're asking that much of an organic grower, just be prepared to again, $5 for a carrot. Um, I hope that answers that. And Solvig said, do tomato flowers need to be hand pollinated? Uh, John, why don't you answer this one? Um, yeah, uh, um, no, they don't, no, no, no. Tomato flowers, um, um, they can just be planted outside, um, and you'll just find that the um, that the um, uh, that the plant will start to grow yellow flowers, and um, all of your flowers will uh, uh, become tomatoes. So if you see like ten flowers growing on your tomato plant, you'll get ten uh, um, you'll get ten tomatoes. Uh, yeah, so they don't need to be hand pollinated, no. <clears throat> Okay, so you don't have to twiddle them. No, no. Okay, no twiddling uh, necessary. They just happen naturally, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, good. actually, um, if I can address that as well, Solvig, that's a good question. I believe that some, in some cases, you do need to hand pollinate because especially if you're going on a rooftop in the city, there may not be a lot of pollinators like bees and such flying around. So what you can do is take either a paintbrush or a Q-tip and you touch each of the flowers in turn and make sure you come back around to that first one you touched so that you're cross pollinating flower to flower. That's basically what bees do. And my favorite podcaster again, Mike McGrath says, go outside and have sex with your plants, <laughs> which is basically what you're doing. I, I just love that image. So you might wanna try it if you're not getting a lot of uh, tomatoes because yeah, they do need to be touched by a bee or something. Whereas beans and peas do not, they're self pollinating. Hope that answers that. Uh, Rebecca, do you save seeds? Do you pass them around to people? I'd love to get some if so. Rebecca, that's another thing I haven't quite hacked completely. I do try saving some seeds, but being a full-time farmer, it's hard to do absolutely everything, creating my own soil and starting my own transplants and all this other stuff. So seed saving isn't something I'm doing in a big scale, but as soon as I do, Rebecca, I will be in touch and share alike. John, how about you? Do you ever save seeds? Oh, yeah. I uh, think um, um, saving seeds and passing them around to people might be a bit simpler um, here in the city. Um, I'm planning to uh, set out like a gardening uh, meetup very soon, uh, where basically gardeners, um, like myself, can sort of meet up and um, maybe like so once or, or twice a month and share tips and um, uh, um, um, share seeds too. Um, yep. And because we live closer um, than countryside farmers tend to, um, that kind of thing is going to be much more simpler to do. So yeah, um, so people can basically um, share seeds and talk about uh, another best ways to grow them too. So that's a good idea. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And one thing about seed saving is when you grow out a plant, I assume that you mean you grow out a plant, you get a delicious pepper, tomato, and you want to save that seed to plant next year. Just be careful that it's not an F1 seed. 
because F1 seeds will not produce the same fruits that you ate. Um, you got to make sure it's an heirloom seed or a non F1. Uh, that's very, very important. Otherwise, you're going to grow something that you won't be happy with. Uh, let's see. Solvig asks, where to find ladybugs? Boy, that's a good question. I wish I had the answer to. Uh, just scour the countryside for them. And it's a good question to ask on Four Farmers in Japan, that a Facebook group that we're both on. Anyone who's not on that, I, I recommend it. It's a great group for sharing. Uh, or also, uh, what is it? Japan, Sorry, Japan what, Gardening. What was the name of that? What was that? Name uh, Foreign that? Farmers Japan. Foreign uh, Farmers but I know we both are on Japan gardening, and that one's also a good one to ask that same question. I asked that about uh, beneficial nematodes, and somebody came forward and had found some of that stuff. So there are solutions out there. If you can search in Japanese, you might find it as well. John, do you know of any places where you can buy? Uh, or no, find not a fan. No, no. I um, know where to find worms, but not ladybugs. <laughs> that's yeah, a, that's a pretty good question. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, yep. Now, are the farmers uh, um, open to accepting volunteers on their land? Uh, this will be one for you, Chuck. Oh, um, well, I know that I have a volunteer program, um, and I know other people do as well. But most farmers will not accept volunteers unless they're properly trained, basically because they can do a lot more harm than good. I'm a bit more relaxed and open to it. But you will find that a lot of farmers are very uh, picky that you, they, want, they don't want you stomping on their you know, pumpkin vines or pulling out their carrots before they're ready and things like that. So um, farming is a serious thing for some people like me, and we don't want just anybody coming out there and playing. And also, basically, volunteers will often create more work for the farmer. So uh, when you ask, just be respectful and understanding of that. I <coughs> Uh, Rebecca, comment for aging farmers doing raised beds in my farm now because it's getting hard for me to get down on the ground, as we all are, as John said, and terracotta pots are really heavy, so you probably just keep in mind when you're using them. John, what do you think? Um, yeah, uh, sorry about the raised beds, like I was saying, yeah, um, they can be made to be higher so that uh, people don't need to kneel down. Um, terracotta pots, yeah. Um, um, they are heavy for sure, and they'll be heavier when um, they get rained on. Um, that's a key point too. Um, just one uh, point about um, talking with the farmers about um, taking volunteers. Um, there's a, a new thing that started here in Japan called uh, weekend farming, and it's where um, um, basically where countryside farmers um, they um, let people from the city come out, maybe like once or, or twice a month, and the uh, farmers basically rent plots to uh, people that come out to their farms and um, the farmers basically tend to the food and they teach um, families how to grow food. And um, uh, the people that rent these plots, they're typically uh, city folk like us, um, they can take the food home too, um, but the farmer maintains the plot for them. Uh, um, uh, between visits, um, weekend farming, um, um, the Japan Times published a uh, story about weekend farming some years ago. Check that out. That's a good one. John, could you put a link in the uh, in the comments at some point about weekend farming? Yeah, weekend farming, yeah. That would be yeah. super. I, I'm going to start something like that myself, and I'd like to see what other people are doing. Meanwhile, Victoria says, do root vegetables need less sunshine? Would it work to have tomatoes, cucumbers, and beans, et cetera, in the sunnier parts of the balcony or roof and root veggies and herbs and leafy vegetables in the shadier parts? Well, as, as John had said, herbs and leafy vegetables do not need as much sun, but root vegetables actually need a half day or as much sun as possible. So if you're going to grow root vegetables to the size that, that are getting nice and sweet, you're going to want to give them full sun. But the nice thing about root vegetables is they're quite small so that you can grow them at the front of your tomatoes or something like that, where they're getting full sun and not blocking the sun from the tomato plants. They're a nice thing to what's called intercropping or interplanting, where you're growing more than one variety of vegetable in the same container or bed. I would recommend that. John, anything? Um, not to add to that, no. no. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Solvig, Chuck, would you consider bagging up smaller bags of manure for sale as you scoot around the city selling your veggies? <laughs> 
I would, I would, although carrying manure around in my car isn't my favorite thing, but I would do that. But you can buy small bags of manure at the home center. They do make them for home gardeners. So if you needed something in a pinch, you could find it. Um, if you look inside, not outside, basically home centers is John and I both absolutely adore them and know them very well. They sell their bigger bags of, of items outside. Inside the shop itself, you can buy 500 grams of chicken or cow or even bat droppings. Um, so if you look inside, you might find what you want. And I think you're over there near the, the D2, and I know they have them in there. So <coughs> that's for you, Solvig. Um, let's see. Well, that's it for comments and questions. Um, if anybody else has anything else, we can take it. Uh, yeah, quick question. You know, you can buy these fertilizers, li liquid fertilizers. You, they sell them at the, the oh, yeah, yeah. Lynn shop, the colored green, and they come in green. little tubes. And I think they're meant to be just sort of poked into the ground where they will release <laughs> slowly. Okay. <laughs> Frankly, I don't want these sticking out of, they're ugly, so I don't... <laughs> Being an artist, I don't want them sticking out of my pot. What I want to know is, can I um, thin that out? Can I put it into like a, 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 a large container and thin it out with a liter of water? Or how, how would I use that so I can just sort of fertilize this way with, the, you know, with it diluted rather than having this thing poked into all of my little pots? <clears throat> yeah, um, those things there. Um, um... From what I know about them, um, they contain chemicals, so they might not be such a, a good idea um, yeah, to use. Um, but if you do want to use them, uh, yeah, um, they're designed for a slow release, like you kind of guess there. And, but they could just be um, diluted with your um, water inside your watering container and just um, poured on when you water your plants naturally. And um, when you water your plants, yeah. Okay, and so they, would just, mean be, that you they would just be more for flowers and rather than vegetables. I mean, yeah, um, I they apparently be... sort of make your, um, they basically make your plants more ginky, more and more colorful, more healthy looking. Yeah. Would Epsom <clears> salts <throat> do the same thing? Um, Epsom salts? Chuck? Epsom salts are high in magnesium. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, they might be good for flowers, but you're going to have mixed results with that. I like using things in moderation. So anything you try, don't put too much until you're sure it's doing what you want it to do because the plants don't need a lot. They're talking about trace minerals here. Magnesium is something they need in very small quantities. You might want to just try to find a basic organic fertilizer, which is readily available at the home centers nowadays, and try that first. You can even buy liquid forms in a lot of cases. In fact, let me show you one that I like. I hope my green screen doesn't prevent this from being shown. Oh, it is kind of, but this is a good one. This is, this is organic and it's liquid. Uh, you can buy this in uh, the powder form as well. And I'm using this for my seedlings right now. I put a, a little tiny bit in a, in a four liters of water and I, I, I give it a, a gentle feeding every, every week or so. Plants do not want a lot of food. You often can harm the plant or make the plant think like, oh, I've got everything I need. I don't need to grow very strong to find my nutrients because I'm comfortable enough right here. And that plant really won't mature very well. So you want the plants to be challenged a little bit. So anything you add again, do in moderation and try to go organic as John said. Okay. <clears throat> neem oil in Japan. What is I'm neem looking, oil in Japanese? I'm looking at that one up right now. Um, neem oil yep. is just neem abura. So it's neem on that. abura. And I use that a lot, a lot. You can find it online, no problem. Um, I believe it's actually legitimate to order it from out of the country if you're buying in bulk, because it is quite cheap. I know that people can buy like a liter of that stuff for like a thousand yen in the States, whereas here about, oh, 100 milliliters will cost you about a thousand yen. So it's quite high priced here. So, but if you do need it, you can buy it. And uh, I, I like using it as well. So I recommend it. Um, can I ask you about vinegar? Yeah. For pests. That's what I heard that vinegar is very good. Again, I, as I mentioned before, um, or maybe I didn't, you know, I might've forgotten that Rebecca, sorry, is check 
to see what works for your pests. Because if you just hear, oh, neem oil works for pests, but then it doesn't work for this one because it doesn't mm. do that. Make yeah. sure your, your solution is pest specific. So mm -hmm. vinegar is going to work for some things and not mm -hmm. for others. A good example is that is just mixing a little tiny bit of liquid dish soap with a whole lot of water and you spray it on stink bugs and stink bug kin, that'll mm -hmm. kill them in a minute. But that will not work on a lot of other beetles and other things that you want to get rid of. So of again, whatever solution you go for, make sure you do your internet research. Because even I don't remember them all. So <laughs> it's important that you're specific about that. That's a good question. Okay. Well, we're at 1130. I don't see anything else in the chat. John, if you've got anything else you wanted to add before we sign off. Uh, no, that's about it. Uh, yeah, no. um, thanks for joining. It's uh, nice to see so many people here. Um, if you have any questions, just um, feel free to email either Chuck or myself. I'll just uh, put my mail into the comment section now. Um, you might want to do the same, uh, Chuck. For sure, for sure. Yep. And uh, yeah, I'm going to write that now. Just write. Feel free to send any questions and, that you have. Uh, you can contact me through that. John, your presentation was wonderful as always. Thank you, everybody, for joining us again in Fantastic Farming number two. John and I will roll out number three once we get uh, our schedule set up. Spring's a busy time for us with planting, but we're we're dedicated to this thing uh, to try to get the word out there. To we're still learning as well. Don't feel like we're we've got it all figured out. We're still hacking this thing called growing our own food. And it's a wonderful journey of lifelong learning and, and community building and all this other great things that bring so many things into play. And remember, we're helping the environment, we're supporting our communities, and we're building healthy bodies so that we can have a brighter future. And that's really what it's all about. So thanks for joining us, everybody. We hope to see you again. Drop us a line or a question anytime, and we'll see you next time. Can I yeah, see one more oh. quick question in? I got, okay, ask this one. we've got Organic time for one eggs. more. Free range eggs, Chuck, do you, do you have access to free range eggs? I do. I'll ask if there's another, you've been like the 20th person who's asked me that in the past okay, couple of years. Okay. My <laughs> farmer's quite small scale, so yeah. I'm sorry, it may be a no, but that's another one to put out there on the farming lists because eggs can ship. Uh, you okay. know, on the Facebook groups and things like that, because they are better. And maybe someday I'll have my own hens. I, I'm looking forward yeah. to it because there's nothing. No, good, to, good to know. Thank you. Um, Thank you, both yeah. of you. It's wonderful. I so enjoy this. Yeah. Thanks, a lot. thanks everybody. Yeah. Yeah, you, have thanks a great, you have a great day and we'll see you next time. Um, okay. Bye. Yeah, bye.